The Battle of the Frogs and Mice Attributed to Homer Rendered into English by Jane Barlow You, Heliconian choir divine, I first entreat, ye sisters nine, come enter now this heart of mine and help accord in singing the song I writ not long ago, o'er knee-propped tablets, bending low whose strains I vowed should widely flow to ears of mortals bringing. A tale of boundless strife and jar. With martial clangor echoing far, how valiant mice went forth, to war, gainst frog hosts, horse, and brindled. In deeds of prowess, fain to excel the feats of earthborn giants, fell, that wandering mortals won't to tell, and thus the feud was kindled. A thirsty mouse whose flight outstripped the cat's grim claws that else had gripped as in a neighboring lake he dipped his dainty chin, pleased greatly, to taste its water's honeyed tide, him drinking thus, anon espied a loud-voiced frog, the marsh's pride, and spoke in accent stately. Ho stranger, who and whence art thou? Say who thy sire? Be heedful now, and all I ask with truth about, lest I deceiving find thee, for thee, if worthy proved, I'll bear unto my home, fast by and there, with many a goodly gift and rare in friendship I will bind thee. Myself am puff cheek. Monarch crowned by all the frogs whom in its bound this lake clips, held in awe profound, and them I rule for ever, me the fair queen of waters whore, to paddler, prince of mud pools, bore upon the amber-strewn shore of Eridanian river. And thee above thy mates extolled, for strength and beauty. I behold a sceptred king, a warrior bold, on fields of fight undaunted, but haste thee now, and speedily declare to me thy lineage high. He said, then Grabcrumb made reply, and in these words he vaunted. Why seekest thou, forsooth, to know, my race and name, both famed, I trow? Mongst gods above, and men below, and birds in heaven that hover? I, Grabcrumb height, for father claimed, not crust great sold, my mother came of royal stock, Lickmeal her name, her sire the king ham lover. Me in sequestered cell she bore, and there with food a plenteous store. Ripe figs, and nuts, and dainties more of divers kind she fed me. And never once in fiercest fight could death itself my soul affright, but mid the thickest fray aright my dauntless sprite hath led me. Nor man, though huge his size, I dread, but boldly leaping on his bed. While slumber holds his heavy head, I nibble at his fingers, or sometimes seize him by the heel, yet not a pang that man doth feel, and sleep that did his eyelids seal, for all my biting lingers. But of all things, beneath the sun. Two more than aught I fear and shun, one is the wheeling hawk and one the cat, that monster hideous, these twain to me much woe have brought, and eke the trap, with wailing fraught, where many a rueful deed is wrought by crafty wiles insidious. But most the peering cat fear I, because the whole mouth lurking nigh, in pouncing on the passerby, she horribly excelleth. Can we, whom nature doth assign such devious lots, be friends? For thine a watery life decrees, but mine, to gnaw men's goods impelleth. Nor scape my keener sight, or smell, thrice luscious, loaves, full orbed. That swell and wicker basket rounded well, nor delicate wafer, spreading her broadening border hems, for these are all bedecked with plenteous cheese, and sesame upon the breeze celestial odors shedding, ham slice, nor livers in their vest, of snow white fat, nor cheese new pressed, nor honey cake. That e'en the blessed year and after, nothing scorning, nor aught that skillful cooks prepare for mortals' feasts with toil and care, with sundry spices rich and rare, their pots and pans adorning. But neither root of radish raw, nor crumpled cabbage leaf I gnaw. No rounded gourd my busy jaw hath nibbled through, nor feed I on waterish leek or parsley green, such fair as this your own hath been, tis all yon lake affords, I ween, wherein your life ye lead I? Then Puffcheek smiled. Thou, friend. He spake. Of meat and drink too much wouldst make, both on the land, and in the lake, we see full many a wonder. Zeus doth a twofold pasture keep for frogs, since here on earth we leap, and there lie spread the waters deep, to hide our bodies under. But wouldst thou eke these marvels view? That were an easy thing to do, come, mount my back, cling close thereto, so needst thou dread no danger, for to my home in high content. I'll bear thee straight, if thou consent. Thus Puffcheek said, and lowly bent, before the willing stranger. And he, 
with both hands grasping tight the frog's soft throat, up vaulted light, and at the first, while still in sight of neighboring harbors keeping, it seemed a joyful ride to him, well pleased to feel King Puffcheek swim, but when the waves all dark and grim plashed o'er him sorely weeping, he chid repentance steading not, and tore his hair like one distraught, each shrinking foot that dryness sought beneath his body squeezing, heart shaked with fear, by strangeness bred, he longed once more the earth to tread, and faintly groaned for icy dread, his very soul was freezing. And through the tide his outstretched tail he like a steering or did trail, while heaven with prayers he did assail for help soon landward guiding, but still the dark waves o'er him swept, and loud and long he wailed and wept, nor silence then from speech he kept. But spoke his fortune chiding. Not thus, methinks, the billows o'er, his load of love the white bull bore, who brought Europa to the shore of Crete renowned in story, not like this frog, who now alack, speeds home with me upon his back. His pale shape spreading on his track across the waters hoary. But now an awful sight appeared, a sight that stoutest hearts had feared, a water snake his head upreared above the lake fierce frowning, which puff cheek did anon perceive, and dived, his own escape to achieve intent. Nor thought it shame to leave his noble comrade drowning. Down to the lake's dark depths he slid, where, saved from bitter death, he hid, but on his back the waves amid fell grab crumb, thus deserted and clenched his hands, and squeaked amain, and oft times sank, and oft again. Rose wildly kicking all in vain, his doom was unaverted. For wetted hairs, a burden great, soon dragged him downward, by their weight, at last he cried, while cruel fate, his speedy end, was bringing. Deem not false frog thy wiles, can shun, the full reward the deeds have won, me from thy back. Shipwrecked, undone as from a rock ledge flinging. Not on dry land, thou caitiff white, in wrestling, race, or toilsome fight, hadst thou surpassed my matchless might, but here, my steps betraying, hast me into the water's thrust. Yet God quites all. For this thou must, to my troops, make atonement just, nor shalt thou shun their slaying. This said, of death's dark cup he drank, but, seated on the grassy bank, lick plate beheld him, as he sank, and, doleful outcries shrilling, home all in haste, he straightway sped. And amongst the mice's tidings spread, who heard the news, while anger dread the heart of each was filling. Then market wards at break of day, they bade their heralds take their way, the mournful tale without delay, to Nacrest's halls, to carry. That sire held luckless grabcrumb deer, whose corpse now floating in the mere, swam on the midmost tide, nor near the shore, might longer tarry. But when in haste, as morning smiled, these heralds came, King Nacrust, wild with wrath and grief, to lose his child, rose speaking words impassioned. O oh, friends! Though tis alone my lot to meet such ills from frogs, I what the mischief of their crafty plot against us all was fashioned. And now I am indeed forlorn, since three fair sons I needs must mourn, the first hath perished, from me torn by cat's fierce talons mangled. Hard, by his hole, the wretch was slain. The next by savage men was tain drawn to his doom, nor seen again, through hateful arts new fangled. For they on deeds of slaughter bent, a wood-wrought work of guile invent, it cleft a trap, therein pent, full many a mouse hath perished. But now the third, my youngest son, most dear, alas, to me undone, whom, since his life was first begun his mother's care hath cherished, he now by puff cheeks wiles misled, Neath watery depths lies drowned and dead. To arms, and march, our hosts. He said. Against this foe arraying, our bodies decking for the fight in harness subtly wrought aright. Then straight to arms flew every wight, his monarch's word obeying. And first their legs with greaves, to fit the pale green beans in twain they split. Whose pods by night they gnawed and bit the work advancing fleetly. Their breastplates were of leather made with pointed reeds all overlaid to gain the skin a cat was flayed, and they were fashioned featly. The metal for each warrior's shield a handlamp's midmost boss must yield long needles as a spear they wield, in combat fiercely shaken, sheer brass, for martial deeds designed, and for a helm their brows to bind, the wrinkled husk wherein ye find the chickpea's fruit was taken. Thus capapi the mice were armed, which, when the frogs perceived alarmed up from the water's brink they swarmed, and towards one place repairing, 
stood there in warlike conclave sit. But while they sought the cause to wit that such a flame of wrath had lit, and whence the discord. Bearing his staff in hand a herald came, great-hearted Scoopchi's son, by name as Hompot known, who did proclaim his hostile errand, saying. Me, O ye frogs, on vengeance bent, with many a threat the mice have sent to bid you arm, your hosts intent on war and strife arraying. 4. Floating yonder on the tide, they grab crumbs piteous corpse have spied, who by the hand of Puffcheek died, your monarch treacherous hearted. But now, to arms, ye chieftains bold, whom first in fight the frog folk hold. His message thus the herald told, and on his way departed. But every frog's proud heart was stirred with trouble by each lofty word, then puff cheek, when anon he heard all shame upon him crying stood forth and answered. Friends, not I this mouse prince slew, nor saw him die. Methinks the lake's marge sporting nigh, he met his fate in trying to imitate the swimming grace of frogs, but now his people base accuse me guiltless to my face, though harm I never did them. Come, seek we here some sage device, to extirpate these crafty mice, and thus, for so runs my advice. I trow, we best may rid them, upon the utmost brink our band should armed for fight all take their stand beside the lake, where close at hand the sloping banks sinks sheerest, and when the foe with fell onslaught against us rush, then quick as thought each warrior. By the helmet caught as he approacheth nearest, we helm and all may hurl adown where far beneath the black depths frown, for this, when we have watched them drown, by skill, to swim unaided we all may rear to heart's delight a trophy of mouse-murdering fight. Then straight to arms flew every white, by puffcheek speech, persuaded. And on their legs they bound for grease the ample folds of mallow leaves, a breastplate strong no lance thrust cleaves from fair green beetstalks stripping and cabbage leaves that broadly sprout, they deftly wrought to bucklers stout, keen-pointed rushes all the rout with long-staved spears equipping. And o'er, their heads defended well, the horns of little snails that dwell in traveling homes of whirled shell, for helmet plumes were waving. Thus panoplied, in warlike mood upon the lofty banks they stood, and shook their spears, while wrath imbued their souls for combat craving. But now in heaven's starry hall, Zeus, did the gods together call, and showed that martial concourse all of warriors brave and mightful, in numbers vast. And large of limb, long spear shafts wielding, in such trim march, monstrous hordes of giants grim, and centaur legions frightful. Then asked, and smiled the sight to see which god the mice's friend would be, the frog's witch. Daughter mine. Said he, Athene, thither speeding. Thou lt aid the mice? For evermore, they frisk about thy temple floor, on odorous fat and diverse store of dainties sweetly feeding. Thus Zeus, but then the heavenly maid. O oh, sire, not I, in sooth. She said, Will forth these harassed mice to aid, whence many an ill betid me. For oft my wreath decked shrines they spoil, and break my lamps in quest of oil. But most with wrath my blood doth boil, at this shrewd turn they did me, the robe that I with toil did spin, of warp and woof so fine and thin, their teeth have gnawed, and left therein full many a rent unseemly. And now the cobbler every day duns me, and makes me interest pay on debts long due, which, sooth to say, immortals loathe extremely. For, borrowing thread, I spun, and lack the means to pay the lender back, but none the more to guard from rack the frogs I forth have speeded. For eke witless folk are they, weak-minded, twas, but yesterday, war worn and weary from the fray when sleep I sorely needed, their senseless clamor rose on high, nor suffered me to close an eye, all night I needs must sleepless lie, with throbbing temples aching. Till cocks crew out at morning tide, but come, ye gods, forbear. She cried, to give them aid on either side, lest part in conflict taking, some one of us, by dire mischance, be hurt with keen-edged dart or lance, for hand to hand these dare advance, gainst even a god assailing. But so from heaven's securest height, we gazing down, may watch their fight, and struggle to our heart's delight. Thus she with words prevailing, and all the gods, persuaded, drew in crowds together then forth flew shrill gnats, with mighty trumps, and blew a fearful call, to battle. A signal fierce loud trumpeted, and ere twas ended, overhead of direful war and omen dread, they heard Zeus thunder rattle. 
First croak aloud at Lickster thrust, who in the foremost ranks, did joust, and pierced him through and through, with dust his downy fur was blanched, as prone he fell, his armor rang upon his limbs with echoing clang, as thud he dropped. Then forward sprang bold creep in hole, and launched his glittering spear, the sturdy stave in Mudson's breast was fixed, and gave black death his due, his spirit brave flew fluttering forth. Then Beatley slew Hauntpot, pierced to his heart's core, and Munchcake wounded Muchboy sore. Who headlong fell and rose no more, his soul forth fluttering fleetly. But Gracemere, wrath his fall to note, pierced Cree Pinhole's defenseless throat, which Herbson's heart with sorrow smote, who straight, keen reedlance plying. So fierce a blow at Gracemere struck, that in the wound the weapon stuck, nor strength availed it forth to pluck, and down he fell a dying. Next Lickster poised his shining spear, nor missed his mark, but smote him sheer in the liver. Then in flight drew near Munchwort, whom Lickster spying along the deep grassed banks pursued, nor stayed from fight but hacked and hewed till down he sank, by might subdued, to rise no more, and lying a mangled corpse the shore beside. His lifeblood stained the rippling tide, and there hard by bold Nipchees died, a warrior brave and blameless, while Minty filled with fear and dread at sight of valiant scoop cheese, fled for safety, to a watery bed, his shield down flinging, shameless. Then bore bold Hauntpot Hunt stumped down and Gracewave smote with pebble, thrown the chieftain Nipham on the crown, that all his brains were scattered, and all the sword stained with blood. Brave Lick Plate next, by couch and mud, was slain. And darkness like a flood, closed o'er his eyes, thus shattered. When Green Leek saw him fall half slain, the foremost ranks he cleft amain, and not crest smote, but smote in vain, his shield all darts repelling, but soon his matchless helmet felt. For brass thereof the smiths did melt four priceless pots, a buffet dealt by sour herb all excelling. Bog Trotter then, who watched the fight, a handful huge of mud flung right in Filchcrum's face, all foully dight, and him had well nigh blinded, whereat enraged. Upheaving straight, with mighty hand a boulder great, from off the plain, a cumbrous weight to slay Bog Trotter minded, against his knees the mass he dashed, the ponderous stroke in pieces smashed his dexter leg, and down he crashed, his form in the dust extending. Whose fall to avenge, then Croakwell flew on Filch Crumb fierce, and made him rue that evil hour, pierced through and through with keen edged lances rending. When Creep in Hole on his fate did look, set, lamed and fight, beside a brook, Within a ditch, he refuge took from bitter death. Hard pressed. Then Nawcrust with a thrilling dart lanced Puffcheek's foot, and at the smart to seek the lake's remotest part, the king fled, sore distressed. When Green Leek saw his helpless course, seized by the foot without remorse, he dragged him down and plunged perforce. Beneath the wave upstart. Stout Filch Crumb, then his wrath to wreak for friend slain, pierced ere he could seek the land. Before him fell Green Leek, whose soul toward hell departed. A godlike chief he was, confessed of all the frogs in battle best, yet when the king, with rage possessed, rushed on him, breathing slaughter, his glorious name his deed disgraced, nor once the dauntless chief he faced, but fled the fight in headlong haste, and plunged beneath the water. But of all mice the bravest one was Snap Scrap, noble Filchbred son, whose father saw the fight begun and homeward straight repairing, he bade him join the fray, but hide himself, and near the waterside exulting stood to watch with pride his dear son's deeds of daring. But loudly swore the gallant youth, to spoil the frogs, nor show them ruth, then cleft in twain a nutshell smooth. His gear therewith completing, and thus in matchless might arrayed with folded arms his foes surveyed, at sight of whom the frogs dismayed, fled toward the lake retreating. And now, so strong was he and stout, their wreck he soon had brought about. But Zeus was quick to mark their rout, and soon the menaced slaying of wretched frogs, did Ruth inspire in gods, and men's immortal sire, who shook his locks, and, moved to ire, his mind thus uttered, saying, Alack, strange doings, meet mine eyes. Lo, every frog in panic flies. Where round the lake this snap scrap hies, and snaps up all before him. Come, send we hence, without delay, Ares, and warlike Pallas, they I trow could drive him from the fray, how fierce sower he bore him. Thus Zeus, but Hera answered, gave. 
not Pallas, no, nor Ares brave, have might, O king. The frogs, to save from utter wreck ensuing, but let us all together go, and thus enforce our aid bestow, or hurl thou down against their foe thy weapon mischief doing, the bolt that Titans overthrew, and Capanius the mighty slew, Enceladus, nor all the crew of savage giants sparing. Come launch it forth, for by its stroke the bravest warrior's force is broke. Then, smouldering all with flame and smoke, Zeus flung his bolt far faring. But first he wide Olympus shook by thunders, then with wrathful look his awful thunderbolt he took and brandished, swiftly whirling. Forth from the monarch's hand it sped, grim death and grievous scathe, to spread and smote all hearts with fear and dread where'er he sent it hurling. Yet not even then the mice gave o'er, their battle fierce beside the shore, but rather hoped, in sooth. The more brave frogs, to spoil and plunder, but Zeus from heaven the fight surveyed, and, pitying much the frogs dismayed, an ally sent to bring the maid, and keep the mouse foe under. Sudden they sidled on, crook-clawed, flat-backed as anvils, scissor-jawed. With hides like shards of pipkins, flawed on shoulder, burnished brightly, with legs bowed in, arms sprawled about, eyes, deep in breast, set peering out, hard shells, eight feet, two horns a sprout, and crab's men, call them rightly. These did with might the mice assail, who, nipped by hand, and foot, and tail, their spears against such stubborn mail, thrust, vainly backward bended. Then fear on every mouse did grow, they turned and fled, nor faced the foe. But now the sun had set, and so this one day's war was ended.